And the devaluation of ourself that we think we need fixing is a result of not being true to ourself. You don't need to fix yourself when you're authentic. This is a very interesting topic that we want to address today because many people compare themselves to other people, judge themselves in turn, and not appreciate themselves. And they're, kind of, they're trying to fix themselves. So I'm going to start with a story that may be applicable, and then I'll branch it out to see the relationship of why we do this, why we beat ourselves up, why we're not honoring ourselves. Now, you may not be doing that, but you may have friends that do that, and so you can pass this information on to them. But it may be also some moments in your life where you feel this way. So I had a client who is a very beautiful, very attractive woman that I don't think that too many people, men or women, would deny uh, the attractiveness. But although all the people around her was recognizing her beauty, both inner and outer, she wasn't. And when we started to go down the rabbit hole, you might say, and start to figure out what was driving this, we found out that she was comparing herself to a variety of other women. So there's one woman that she was looking at and saw, wow, what beautiful hair she has, thick, really gorgeous hair. And because of that, she wasn't looking at the whole woman. She was just looking at that portion of the woman, the hair, and comparing her hair to that and noticed her hair was a little thinner, a little less shiny, a little less full. And so she was self-depreciating and comparing to somebody she put on a little pedestal, not for the whole picture, but just that little piece, just the hair. But she didn't stop there. She also noticed that somebody else had a little flatter ab. Instead of a bit of a pooch, she had a flatter abs. And so now she's comparing her abs to that and also a little self-depreciation on her abs. But she didn't stop there. She also looked at her cheekbones and her jaw and noticed that there's a little bit more sag than some other girl that she saw that had this really firm chin line. And she kept going around to various women in her life and the individual woman that she was comparing herself to, the whole package was not as magnificent, probably to people's eyes than hers. But in each of those parts, she was comparing herself to those people. Now the whole, no, but those parts. And because of that, she was putting them on a pedestal and minimizing herself in turn and not honoring and appreciating herself and then trying to fix herself and try to be somebody she wasn't. I've said before that everybody's been given the body that's required to fulfill their mission in life. Now, even though the world has acknowledged her as very beautiful, she couldn't see it. And what's interesting is this subordination to the admiration of other people can keep you from honoring and the magnificence of who you are. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. You'll destroy yourself comparing yourself to other people because there's parts of you that are worthy of admiration just like hers, but you're not honoring that. They have a different set of values, a different set of structures, a different set of advantages and disadvantages. I believe everybody has advantages and disadvantages. Sometimes you find very, very attractive people that may not have the greatest personality, or you may have somebody that may not be as attractive that has incredible personality and vibrant. And everybody is given some sort of, you know, advantages to their behavior or their skill or their beauty or something allows them to compete in the marketplace, you might say, in life. But she wasn't honoring it. So she was in a sense living in sort of a body dysmorphia syndrome. But the body dysmorphia syndrome doesn't stop with the body. The same principle holds in reverse. You could look down on somebody and exaggerate yourself and puff yourself up and then compare these same little parts and think, well, I'm better than that. And we can end up being exaggerating ourselves or minimizing ourselves and pride or shame, exaggeration, minimization of self, which is inauthentic. Our real self is not an exaggeration or minimization. Those are facades and personas that we wear 
because we compare ourselves to other people. And none of those are really our true self. We want to be loved and appreciated for who we are as an individual, but when we're not being who we are, it's hard to do that. It's hard to be loved for it when we're not even willing to do it. So every time we put people on pedestals or pits, and we don't put them equally with equanimity in our heart, we don't have the ability to be loved for who we are because we're not being who we are. We're exaggerating or minimizing ourselves or minimizing or exaggerating ourselves relative to the people and exaggerating or minimizing them. Those women that she was comparing to didn't have an overall package greater than hers, just happened to have some parts, just like she had parts that were greater than somebody else's in their minds, probably. They're probably envious people looking up to her for her beauty. But as long as we're sitting there and comparing ourselves to other people, instead of comparing our own daily actions to what's deeply meaning to us, what's really priority to us, we're going to be distracted by these exaggerated and minimized self. And what's interesting is we only want to fix ourselves when we compare ourselves to other people. And we only think we make mistakes when we're trying to live in other people's values. And we only think that other people make mistakes when we're expecting them to live in our values. And their own values are making decisions. Their perception, decisions, or actions are based on their own values, and they're not making a mistake in their own values. They're evaluating according to their information they're perceiving, and therefore making a decision based on the data that they have. But we may expect them to live in our values and see a different world, and then they don't fit it, and then we think they're making a mistake. Just like if we expect to live in somebody else's values or try to be somebody we're not, we'll beat ourselves up. Albert Einstein said it really nicely. When your cat's expecting to swim like a fish, you're going to beat yourself up and think there's something wrong with you. And you're going to want to fix yourself. And when you're a fish trying to climb a tree like a cat, you're going to beat yourself up, think there's something wrong with you. You're going to want to try to fix yourself. What if you didn't need to fix yourself? What if you could look in the mirror and realize that whatever you perceive in other people, you have in your own form according to your own values. And that is the magnificent part of yourself that you may not be honoring. Now, this dysmorphic response is not limited to looks, as I said. It also deals with business, and this can happen in men and women. You could compare yourself to somebody that you think is more achieving in business and then minimize yourself and then judge yourself thinking, I need to fix myself. I need to be more like them in business. Or you might be doing this in finance. You might think they're wealthier than me and, oh, my God, I, I'm, 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 I'm lower in socioeconomics and then have a dysmorphia in finance or dysmorphia in business, equivalent, like she had a dysmorphia in body. And this can occur also in a relationship. I've seen this very often where somebody looks at somebody else and they're seeing somebody else that's in a romantic mood, even though they may be fighting an hour earlier or an hour later. And we think, oh my God, what's wrong with my relationship? Somehow I'm not getting that. And then they punish the person they're with because they're comparing them to a fantasy person that may not be long-term or lasting. And the same thing socially, you think somebody's got more Facebook uh, connections or, or more social media connections or something. And you think, oh, my God, I don't have it. I'm a nobody. Or you might exaggerate yourself. Again, dysmorphia. And of course, physically, the same thing we've already discussed. And spiritually, you could do it too. You think, well, they're more spiritually aware, more enlightened or something. Or more quoted of great philosophy or something. Anytime you compare yourself to other people and put them on a pedestal or a pit, you've just lost your true identity. And the magnificence of who you truly are is far greater than any fantasies you impose on yourself. And it's a fantasy to try to live in somebody else's values and try to be somebody you're not. It's a fantasy to expect yourself to be like them. I know a lady that actually didn't like the way her cheeks and her face quite was and decided to go get a little face done, her facelift. The only problem is that the outcome was not what she expected. And she was now minimizing herself to somebody else. When she got through, she got the lesson that was needed. I wish I had kept it the way it was. I actually look better that way. Because now she's lost her identity with this new look, and it really wasn't her. By the way, if you ever go to a plastic surgeon, you might want to look at the ladies that they're creating. Sometimes it's their idea what beauty is. And if that doesn't match who you are and what you believe it is or somebody else that you're dating is or living with or something like that, you might want to pay a price there. You might want to check because sometimes what they imagine beauty to be, they'll be filtering it. Because I watched one plastic surgeon and it had 14 women that almost looked identical when they got through. And it was the, the person that they believed was beautiful in their own image. Everybody's got a different search image. So be aware of that. We sometimes pay a price for trying to be somebody we're not. 
I really believe that all the symptoms in our physiology, psychology, sociology, and events in our life are feedback mechanisms to get us to be authentic, where we love ourselves and appreciate ourselves for who we are instead of who we think we're supposed to be. I think as Einstein said, when you're a cat trying to swim or a fish trying to climb a tree, you're gonna beat yourself up and not honor the magnificence of who you are. So you wanna give yourself permission to do that. And one way to help you do that, I'd like to share this, because you don't need to fix yourself, is to actually identify those people that you find yourself looking at admiring. Instead of admiring them and minimizing yourself, which I found very unproductive, I found that, I found out as a public speaker, working with people in the speaking industry, that the only fear of speaking is not speaking because people speak to people one-on-one -on -one all the time. It's the second you get up in front of a stage and you speak to somebody that you think is more knowledgeable or more successful or more achieving or wealthier, you're subordinating to something you think they have that you don't. And as long as you perceive that they have something you don't, you're going to play a little bit smaller. You're going to self-depreciate. You're going to minimize yourself. You're going to want to change and fix yourself. And then you're going to judge yourself and hold yourself back from opportunities in life that you could be shining with. But what's interesting is I had a woman that was having a major fear about presenting and I had her go through there. I rolled up a piece of paper, made it into a tube, and I had her look in the audience who it was she was intimidated by. And we identified three women. I said, what is it about that woman? I went up on stage and when she froze and helped her. I said, what is it about that woman that you're intimidated by? And she says, well, she's got more education than I do. Great. You have, you're about to speak about your own life. You have more knowledge about your own life than she'll ever have. But you're assuming that she has more education in the field that you'll be talking sort of around. So I asked her, I asked the woman who was speaking, I said, where do you have what you see in her? The seer, the seeing, and the seen are the same. Whenever you look inside and find out what you see in others inside yourself in your own unique form, you level the playing field and you don't sit there and inject their values and try to inculcate them in your life and try to be somebody you're not. You honor yourself for being who you are. So I had to go in there and identify where she had education and where she had knowledge that this lady didn't have and where she was empowered in her knowledge. And when she finally leveled that playing field, that lady was no longer intimidating. She went to the next lady and said, well, this lady looks more successful. And I said, but where are your successes? Your achievements are in your values. Her achievements and her values. If you think her values are more important than yours, you're going to think she's more achieving than you. And I made her stop and look at where her achievements were and list those right there in front of the group until they were equal. Once they were equal, she was no longer intimidated by that person. And then the other one was more socially savvy, more socially connected and influential. And I asked her where her social savvy is. And it's, I said, isn't it interesting? You're the one up on stage, not the lady in the audience. So obviously they're acknowledging you. And I, and I started to make her look at where did she have the social influence in the own form and in the individuals, because then she realized that she was influencing individuals that have massive influence in the world. And when she did, she stopped, she got a tear in the eye and she looked out and the lady out there wasn't intimidating. And I said, now, is anybody here in the room that's intimidating? And she goes, no. I said, I'm now gonna step off the stage. You can now proceed. She did an amazing job at presenting without any anxiety and fear because she was no longer subordinating to somebody else and comparing herself. She was now focusing on her mission of what the message was. Those are the mission of a message to the audience. And she got a standing ovation at the end because they realized where she started with, where she started in the talk and what she achieved. And when she got through the very three women that we picked out, are the ones that gave her the starting of the standing ovation. And then one of them turned around and said to her, he said, you may think that I'm more intelligent and because I have a degree, but I haven't done anything with my degree. Yes, I have a degree, but I never did anything with it. And I'm sitting here looking at you and going, you didn't have that, but look what you've accomplished. And when she heard this, she got tears and eyes. They hugged each other. They literally hugged each other right on the spot. Because sometimes the first appearance is sometimes uh, not the truth. It's the facade that we make up in our mind. That's why we're not here to compare ourselves to other people. We're here to compare our own actions to our own values and our own dreams and look at how congruent you are. When we live by our highest value, we live by filling our day with the highest priority actions. We're most objective, least judging, most equitable with other people, most resilient and adaptable to whatever happens 
and we end up honoring ourselves. And whenever we're doing something that's highest in our value, we're spontaneously acting, we're disciplined, reliable, we're focused, we wake up our leader, we do amazing things, and we honor ourselves, and our self worth goes up. When we're living by our highest value, our self worth goes up. But if we try to live in somebody else's values and because of comparison and trying to be somebody we're not, we automatically devalue ourselves. We're not designed to do that. And the devaluation of ourself that we think we need fixing is a result of not being true to ourselves. You don't need to fix yourself when you're authentic. You don't need to fix yourself when you're inspired by what's priority in your life and you're living congruently with that on a daily basis. You don't need to sit there and be, you know, fix yourself or, or, or repair yourself when you're not judging somebody or just loving those people. In fact, just go and think about the moment you've had the most fulfillment. It's when you made a contribution to people's lives and appreciated doing what you love in the way that they appreciate it. And if you fill your day with that, you're not going to have self-depreciation. You're going to have an appreciation and probably an econ economic capital appreciation because people are going to value you. And when the world values you, it's because you value you. But you can't value you when you're not authentic. You can't value when you're playing the imposter. And the imposter is when you exaggerate or minimize yourself and not be yourself. And that's why I'm taking the time to go over this little topic. I don't, I'm not here to teach you how to have dysmorphia. I wanted you to dissolve dysmorphia. I, I've been teaching the Breakthrough Experience, which is my signature program around the world for 32, almost 33 years now. It's going on 33 years in a couple of months. And I've taught it thousands of times. Uh, 1,140 times, pardon me, to thousands of people. In fact, hundreds of thousands of people. And one thing I'm absolutely certain of is the majority of people, majority of people out there are distracted by their comparisons to other people. You know, we're not here to live in the shadows of anyone. We're not here to, to, to you know, be somebody we're not. Be second at being somebody else. We're here to be first at being us. We're here to stand on the shoulders of giants and be an unborrowed visionary and realize that what we see out there is a reflection. And if we're honoring it, the only reason why we're honoring them and putting them on a pedestal is because they're reminding us of something we're too humble to admit we have, but we already have it. Nothing's missing in you. When I was in Nepal, I met with the Bampa Lama many years ago. And we had a dialogue for about an hour and we had a discussion about nothing's missing. I always say at the level of the most authentic self, sometimes called the soul, the state of unconditional love within us, where we're in state of equanimity, nothing's missing. But when we're down in our senses and we compare ourselves to other people, we in our world of judgment, the terrestrial world of judgment, we tend to be too proud or too humble to admit what we see in others inside us. And then we end up minimizing ourselves instead of empowering ourselves. So instead of sitting there and putting people on pedestals, the wisest thing to do, and I teach in the Breakthrough Experience Program, which I want, wish everybody could experience so they can know how to use this tool, the Demartini method, but to go in there and identify what specific trait, action, or inaction do I perceive in this individual that I admire? What specific trait, action, inaction do I perceive them displaying or demonstrating that I admire most? And pin it down, write it down, be very specific. And then go inside yourself and ask the question Go to a moment, me, go to a moment, John, where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating the same or similar behavior as you perceive in them. And where was it? When was it? Who did you do it to? And who perceived you that way? And then go the next time you've done it. And the next time you've done it. And the next time you've done it. And identify where it was, when it was, who'd you do it to and who perceived it. If you keep doing that and keep doing that and keep looking, I guarantee you, you cannot see something in others that you don't have. You may not be aware of it. You may be too humble to admit it, but it's there. And by holding yourself accountable to see it, you will then not look them up and put them on pedestals. You will look across and thank them for revealing to you what has been unconscious in your life that you've been too humble to admit that you have. And you'll honor that you have what they have in your own form and you'll level the playing field. And now instead of trying to fix yourself and change yourself to be like them, you will realize that thank you. You will respect them and appreciate them for revealing to you what you have that you've been not honoring. And if you go any step further and then they go and ask, what's the downside of their form? So you're no longer in fact with their form. And you'll find out that every trait that people have have advantages and disadvantages. And think about a guy that you first go out and date or a girl you date. At first, you're a little blinded by an infatuation. You're conscious of the upside, unconscious of the downside. And then after a day, a week, a month, or maybe six months, you start to see, oh, that trait's got some picadillo sides. It's got some problems. 
that, you know, they may be really good looking, but maybe everybody's looking at them and they're constantly in the center of attention and high maintenance, or they're highly intelligent and they always want to be right. And they want to argue or they want to always uh, talk and not listen or something. Or they might be really good in business and they're preoccupied with business, but there's now downside because you hardly see them. Every trade has advantages and disadvantages. Otherwise, it would go extinct. It has benefits and drawbacks. So that's why if you would admire with somebody or infatuate with somebody, that's because you're blind to the downsides of those behaviors and you're blind to where you have those behaviors. Once you own it by reflection and realize that you have it and other people see it and you're transparent, and then you go and find the downside of the traits you admire in them and take them off the pedestal and level the playing field and see both sides, you don't sit there and put them on a pedestal. You put them in your heart because everybody's got two sides. Every trait's got two sides. Every trait on the planet, even the things that you think are terrible and evil traits aren't, or they would have gone extinct. If they're here, they serve, or they would have gone extinct in human behavior. And the traits you admire has downsides, the trait you despise has upsides. If you balance it out and level the playing field, you put people in your heart, not upon pedestals or pits. And when you put them on pedestal pits, you've got dysmorphia. Dysmorphia by minimizing or exaggerating yourself. And that's not you. When you're proud or shamed, those are personas and masks and facades you wear covering up the real authentic you. You want to give yourself permission to be you. And so by going and doing the Demartini method, which I explained in the break to experience, which are just three questions out of many, many questions I teach you there, I show you how to level the playing field. And the second you level the playing field and don't have them on a pedestal, but have them in your heart, whatever opportunities that they're resonating with, you get the same opportunities. And this is very powerful. I've seen people do this at envied singers, all of a sudden do the method on them and all of a sudden realize, wow, and they started getting opportunities to sing engagements and raise their fees and opportunities and get notoriety. I've seen this in sports and golf. I've seen this in business. I've seen this in almost every field in speaking industry. The second you are honoring yourself, see at the level of your soul, nothing's missing in you. At the level of your senses, things appear to be missing in you. The things that appear to be missing in you are the things you're too proud or too humble to admit you have. Putting people on pedestals or pits and not putting them in your heart cost you. And you end up going to want to fix them or fix you. And by the way, when you try to fix them, if you've ever been in a relationship where you're trying to get them to be more like the way you want them and trying to fix them to live in your values, it's futile. And if you try to live in somebody else's values, it's futile. And the reason it's futile is because you're not designed to be somebody you're not. You're designed to be you. The magnificence of who you are is far greater than any of those fantasies you will put on yourself. So you want to give permission to be you. You know, I, you know, I was interviewed by Vogue magazine a number of years back. And they had 17 questions that they were thrown at me and I, to answer. And the very last question is, Dr. Martini, if there's anybody you could be in the world, who would you like to be? And I thought to myself, I have no desire. I told them, I said, I have no desire to be anybody but Dr. John D. Martini. And they go, oh, really? Well, most people put down, they want to be like this, or they want to be this. I said, I have no desire to be somebody else. I don't want to be the second Elvis. I don't want to be the second at anybody else. I want to be the number one, numero uno of me. And I want you to be able to look in the mirror and go, you know what? I love you. Wow, you're amazing. And I don't mean in exaggerated forms. I don't mean in fake form and imposter form. I mean, actually realizing that you're an amazing person because you have a very unique set of values that lead you to a very unique path in life. And that is your own destiny. And the hierarchy of your values is dictating it. And they, although they change and your destiny is migrating and moving through a life's journey, the magnificence of that journey is unique and yours. And anything you can't say thank you for along that journey is because you compared yourself to other people. You never judge yourself in your own values. You judge yourself through other people's values. Whenever you hear yourself saying, I should, I ought to, supposed to, I got to, I have to, I must, that's not you speaking. That's somebody else that you got in your head or some tradition, convention, or moray in your head, some moral hypocrisy that you're trying to live by that's not you. I'm not here to teach you how to live that way. I'm interested in you being authentic to yourself. You're both nice and mean, kind and cruel, positive, negative, happy and sad. You're going to have the pair of all opposites. And when you finally embrace the whole of you, you don't need to fix yourself. I don't need to get rid of any half of myself in order to love myself. And neither do you. So you want to give yourself permission to be whole. And the way you do it is not put people on pedestals or pits and put yourself in pits or pedestals in turn. Give yourself permission to be you. That's what my breakthrough experience program is for, is to dissolve all that baggage, because all the baggage we have in our life that's stored in our subconscious mind are a result of those judgments.
that we have towards other people and events in our life. And anytime we actually get a moment of grace, a moment of tears of gratitude for ourselves, which was when we're authentic, when we're authentic, we get tears of gratitude. And that's the time, that's when we wake up our super conscious mind, our spiritual awareness, you might say, where we're inspired from within, doing what we love, loving what we do, waking up as a leader of culture, not a follower of culture, not subordinating to the culture around us, but leading the culture within us. The culture within us is all the parts of ourselves working in a unity towards our objective. And that's what's possible. So I just want to take a few moments to go over some of these ideas with you, because I really believe that some of these are good to stick in your head and to think about. You're not here to compare yourself to others. You're here to compare your daily actions to your own highest values so you can fulfill the most inspiring dreams that you have that are yearning to express themselves naturally, innately from within, the calling you have inside the calling of your own soul, the state of unconditional love you have for yourself and others when you're authentic. So to go along with this little class today, the special class that I just gave you, on you don't have to fix yourself. I want you to also to come and join me on this free on-demand masterclass. It's called Increase Your Deserve Level and Finally Get What You Want in Life. Go on there, grab this masterclass, take advantage of this. It's free. Just go listen. If you got something out of this little class, you're going to get something out of this class, this free master class. Take advantage of it. You can't put your hand in the pot of glue without some of the glue sticking. You can't hang out and, and listen to these classes every week. And by the way, if you know somebody that could have benefited by hearing this, if that went through your head, oh, I wish so-and-so could have heard this, please pass this torch and let people know about these weekly presentations I do or these little master classes we do or our website, or doing our value determination process online on our website is free and private, or come absolutely to the breakthrough experience. That's where I can actually make a difference. Literally for 20, I'll be working with you for 24 hours to help you do something extraordinary with your life. You deserve to do a, a life that you dream about. And I'm a firm believer that it's totally possible. I didn't start out in my, my uh, the way I live today. I started out on the streets as a kid. I started out with learning problems, dyslexia, speaking problems, an arm and deformity and leg and deformity, I had to wear braces as a child. It doesn't matter where you started. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what you're going through. What matters is are you doing the very things that help you do something extraordinary with your life? And that's something you can take command on. And nobody's getting up in the morning and dedicating their life to your fulfillment. It, it has to be you. So I want you to think about that. You don't need to fix yourself. It's time to love yourself. Take advantage of the master class, please. And I'll see you at the break to experience or next week, right online here. And please pass the torch and let people know if this is valuable to you. Please pass the torch because there just may be somebody out there that needs this today. And if so, you made a difference in their life. I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining me today. 